Hey everybody, uh, we have a special guest on my channel and her name is Heidi and she's a writer of the MBTI and she recently um, has a boot camp for INFPs and ENFPs. It's definitely worth checking it out. And um, she also has a survival guide, two survival guides, one on the INFP and the other one on the ENFP. So welcome to my channel, Heidi. Thank you. And I think it's super fun that speaking of INFPs and ENFPs, we are an ENFP and an INFP. So we can kind of cover all the bases today. Yes. So let's get started. So um, what can you tell us about um, INFPs and ENFPs? I can start with like what I kind of focus my work on in relation to INFPs and ENFPs. Mm -hmm. Because I think something that really struck me when I started working in the field of MBTI and I started out like writing a lot of articles and just getting in touch with more and more people who are interested in the area was that there was this kind of negative view about what ENFPs and INFPs specifically were capable of um, and perceivers in general. Like I think that- I would the agree way with that. Right, like we're kind of described as these people who are fun and go with the flow, but like don't get a lot done or can't really organize themselves or um, you don't want to give a project or trust them too much. And I just really felt like that was not true to my experience, um, both having lived my whole life as my own type and with the ENFPs and INFPs I knew. Like I was like, these are people with incredible depth of experience and understanding and knowledge. And they're very contemplative people, very philosophical people. And they're also people who are able to get crazy amounts of work done when they're inspired. Like superhuman amounts of stuff done. Mm -hmm. um, so I started basing a lot of my work around INFP and ENFP empowerment, especially in the last year or two, because I just found that we're types that there's not a lot of resources specifically targeted at. Like when you read, um, you know, lifestyle design books or like habit forming books, they seem very targeted at kind of TJs who really like doing the same thing for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, we can do that, but we're going to, want to die in the process like I can do the same thing every day for two years but I'm going to hate it I'm going to produce my least inspired work so I started thinking a lot more about kind of what resources we could build or it would be possible to build for people like INFPs and ENFPs I think I, I think that's I think that's incredible you're finding you're creating an individualized approach for us and I, I think that's great, especially given the, the literature that is out there to have something that is uh, specially designed for us is wonderful. Yeah, because I mean, I think a lot of members of both types, I feel like I talk to them and they can be very down on the type and be like, oh, because I'm an ENFP or an INFP, you know, I always procrastinate or I don't get anything done. Or um, I get the question a lot like, oh, how have you been so productive as an ENFP? And I'm like, I don't get, I don't understand the question because I owe my productivity to being an ENFP. And to having this like, you know, laser focus when I want something. And um, I think that there's a lot of kind of superpowers that are inherent to both of those types that people just don't know are there or they don't know how to access. Um, I'm, I'm, cu I'm curious about what these superpowers are. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, I think that people don't look at having depth of understanding and passion as superpowers. And those are things that, and perspective shifting. Um, and those are all things that ENFPs and INFPs are swimming in, like our entire life, as you know, you're aware, is about perspective shifting, really deeply understanding things, and then being able to communicate those things clearly and passionately. Mm. And people don't realize what an underrated skill that is and how, how much other people are lacking that skill. And I think that's true of every type. Like, I think every single type has things that they take for granted. And if they were to step into someone else's brain and realize that that thing is absent, they'd be like, whoa, 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 I didn't even know it was possible for that thing to be absent. Um, yeah. But with ENFPs and INFPs, I think we really take for granted how many different perspectives we see and how clearly we're usually able to communicate those once we put the work into deeply understanding them and kind of getting to the bottom of what we believe and what we think about things. Um, and I'd say for all NP types, that's a very underrated skill yes. that you can always champion. So I, I see it's like, if we could really trust ourselves, really trust what our own strengths are, this is this is what you're talking about. And the thing is, it can be like um, disempowering to read a work that tells us this is the way to succeed, and that does not quite work for us. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's like that had been the case for me for a lot of years, which is why I kind of arrived in this place. Was like, 
I'd studied um, health and nutrition. I'd studied meditation and mindfulness. I'd studied um, all of these different, I, I mean, psychology, like all of these different methodologies for organizing your mind and optimizing your performance and your happiness and your um, like vitality. And a lot of it just didn't speak to me. And it's because I wasn't approaching them through the lens of who I was. And I think just by virtue of being rarer types like ENFP, INFP, I honestly think the statistic that says we're like, like, I know ENFPs are supposed to be like 8% of the population. I'm like, I don't know where the rest of them are. <laughs> I think, I think that that's not necessarily true. Um, but that just means we don't meet a lot of people who are very similar to us. Like, I don't know if that's something that you felt in your years as an INFP. Um, and it just means we don't necessarily have the same volume of role models that other types have. So it's like, we have to start getting louder and speaking up more and, and helping each other navigate like the waters of being NFPs more, because now that we have the internet, it's a lot easier than it was like for me as a kid, I didn't know any other NFP adults. I think maybe I'd like one teacher in high school, but um, it can be difficult to find those, those yes, people yes. to connect. With. Yeah. And it's more than just the role models. It's just how, um, things are designed in a way, just like coming into uh, society and, and not really feeling like you're uh, fitting into the mold and and kind of uh, getting scolded for it even, and not and not and yeah. kind of losing that sense of self, sense of trust in who we are. Yeah, a hundred percent. That kind of reminds me of um, like Personality Hacker. I know they talk a lot about how they primarily focus their work on intuitives. They have lots of great resources for sensors too, but they've, I've heard them say in the past multiple times, like the reason we focus the majority of our resources on intuitives is because there's just naturally a lot more resources out there for sensors because population wise, they take up a lot more of the population of the world. So of course they have more systems built that are, that are kind of like aligned with the way that they naturally think and function. Um, but with intuitives, we're kind of just beginning, I think, in the digital age to really have language for what kind of systems and models for self-understanding we need. Mm -hmm. And then being able to find each other and share them with each other is kind of like this new process that's happening. And it's exciting, um, but we're also kind of treading new ground in a lot of ways. So it's it's a team effort. Like, it's funny because it's like even running the boot camps, I'm like, oh, I learned so much just from being in a group of like, I think we've had somewhere around like 130, 140 people go through the program now. And it's like just meeting that many other NFPs is incredible. Like it's like, it gives me so much more information about all the possibilities that exist in these types can, of Can you tell us um, about your boot camp? Like what's the idea behind it? Yeah. So basically, um, I feel like the, I also feel like I'm just on here, like constantly talking about the boot camp. I'm not even like trying to sell it. I'm just like, it's so present in my psyche right now. Um, but basically it's um, a six week program. So we've been running it in real time, which means like we've had people coming in and we do coaching calls once a week. We do like co-working sessions where we bring in a passion project and see how much work we can get done on it in six weeks. Um, but it also comes with daily video modules. So you have six weeks of content that talks about things like, um, mindset and goal setting and lifestyle design and emotional intelligence. Um, we go through like the drama triangle. We go through at, in one iteration, we do the Enneagram um, in the self-study course that won't be in it, but it might be released as a different product at a different time. Um, but we basically drag both the ENFP and the INFP types in different courses across all of these other kind of um, mindset and personal development systems and talk about how to approach them through the lens of your particular type um because a lot of those systems kind of don't give a lot of leniency for who you are and how your personality functions and it works well if you come in just wanting to like learn about yourself so a lot of what it focuses on is um the shadow or the functions and the shadow functions so just learning really really deeply um which functions you have and how they operate and all of like the nuances of how you work and where your blind spots are um, but it also drags that through kind of a lot of different models for like optimizing your life in whatever way you want to optimize it when you come in. So like I really encourage people to kind of set a goal and drag it through the entire course and see how far you can make it in six weeks. And it's cool if like you have a totally different goal going out because you realize like, oh, that goal wasn't that authentic to me. Um, if anything, I think that's kind of like the best case scenario sometimes is just gaining that mindfulness. Um, so it's kind of whatever you want it to be. 
Um, but the goal that I always want people to walk away with is just having more mindfulness about their type and how your personality interacts with all of these other development models that you come into contact with. Um, because you have to have a deep sense of awareness, of self-awareness, um, in order for any of those models to work for you. And I want people to have those critical thinking skills leaving to look at everything in their lives from that point forward, if that's not already what you're doing all of the time. This sounds like a really unique experience to, to have, like a bunch of INFPs, a bunch of ENFPs getting getting together. And, and uh, I, I haven't heard of anything quite like that. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? Because I I always build things that I wish I had. Like, I don't think there's any sense in um, building a product that someone else has already made because I'm like, well, that already exists as a resource, right? Like, um, there's so many people doing awesome stuff in the type space right now. And I'm like, if there's a resource, you know, from Personality Hacker, from Susan Storm, from Dario Nardi, from anyone else who's doing awesome work in the field, like, I don't want to recreate that product. I want to point people to that product. And then I want to go make the thing that hasn't been made that people could benefit from. Because I think that's what the type space does really, really well is kind of discover uncharted territory where people need um, to come together and like advise each other and talk about and like lament over these shared problems that a lot of us have had our whole lives. Um, and the more spaces we can create for doing that, the better. And I think that it's getting great. Like, especially in 2020, a lot of people have been inside a lot. A lot of people have been alone a lot and they've turned to kind of virtual communities, whether it's like Twitter, Reddit, a formal like training program, whatever it is, there's more avenues than there's ever been for us to like come together in that way. And it's an awesome thing. It sounds like really, really therapeutic. So I, I run an online group for people who have social anxiety and to be able to hear yeah. from other people with the similar kind of um, going through the similar kind of experiences. It's, it is, it is really healing to have that kind of experience. Oh my God. Totally. A, I love that you do that. B it's like, yeah, before this year, I was always kind of like, yeah, online communities are cool, but I don't know how much time I'm going to devote to them. Now I'm like an online community junkie. Like I earlier this year, I decided I was going to stop drinking for like a month just cause I was like, I'm drinking too much in the pandemic. And then I joined, <laughs> I joined this like virtual sobriety community and I loved the community so much that it's like three months later and I'm still not drinking, even though I don't really care about not drinking anymore. <laughs> Cause I'm like, I just love this group so much and the conversations that we have and like the depth of conversations that get centered around like, cause you have this group where everyone's talking about their triggers and like what things come up for them when they usually want to choose coping mechanisms. And it just goes so deep that I'm like, all right, I'll just keep being sober because I'm getting more out of being in this group than I am out of drinking. And I'm realizing like, that's the power of online community is that it can really connect to you in a way that like, sometimes just even anonymity, which my courses are not, like we all come in with, you know, our real names and faces, but um, even just having a place to like, kind of talk in a way you wouldn't talk to people in your real life, so to speak, can be so healing and so growing because there's just less pressure. I find a lot of the time with NFPs, there's so much we can perceive of and so much that we kind of want out of our lives that it's hard for us to sit down and set intentions and be like, okay, I'm coming into, let's say this course or this training program or this year of my life with this intention. Um, and I think that that's really, really important for us to do. So I would answer that question by asking you or whoever I was speaking to, like what, what intention do you want to set? And then use your extroverted intuition, which is either dominant or auxiliary for you as an ENFP or INFP respectively, to start figuring out new pathways. Because as soon as you've kind of anchored yourself in something, any really lights up. Um, when you have extroverted intuition and you're not focusing it on something, it can be very scattered. And that's a problem that I find a lot of NFPs face. Like we have very scattered minds, very scattered lifestyles, very scattered goals. And a big problem can just be narrowing it down. And sometimes it's as simple as just picking one thing and being like, this, this might not be the thing, this, let's say goal I want to achieve, or this job I want to take, or this relationship I want to try might not be the thing, but anything we can use to anchor ourselves and start finding a way to um, rein in our extroverted intuition a little bit and have it start looking for specific avenues for growth is going to help us develop uh, competency, like self-trust. I think self-trust is a huge, huge thing for INFPs and ENFPs because we can be so scattered. A lot of the time we'll kind of 
set a goal and then not really get there um, or get distracted by something else and not finish. So I actually think that the most important thing for NFPs coming into my course, but also just in any phase of personal development, just pick a goal, pick a thing you want to accomplish that you know without a shadow of a doubt will make your life better. So that can be, you know, improving your relationships. It can be um, like a physical or mental health goal. It can be a career goal and focus really intensely on it for a period of time and start building the muscles of self-development. And that is kind of a foundational tool where it's like at any point, any goal you set, you need to learn how to use your mindset to get you there. The, the number one thing you can do for like healing or self growth as an NFP is first learn the process of doing it. Learn the process of getting to a goal, learn the process of narrowing yourself in, anchoring on something, and then using your NE to find steps to get you there. Hmm. And that's gonna set up a framework for growth that's gonna help you hugely in the rest of your life once you hmm. kind of have that down. So I'm, I'm curious, like, is, is there an example from your life like applying, applying this kind of concept. Sure. Yeah. I use this every day. So it's like, you can use this on a macro or micro level, but basically I've found, and I mean, this is always changing because I'm always, you know, learning new frameworks and like growing with them. So something I've been working a lot on this year is just becoming very, very aware of triggers that I have. And when people say triggers, normally it's like, they're referring to like some giant, like traumatic event and something that, that triggers it. But um, I come from like an NLP background, which uses the word trigger a lot more lightly. Like it's kind of like, oh, I look at the clock and I start to panic about what I haven't done that day. That means the clock is a trigger. So any, any stimuli in your environment that you automatically associate with a certain like thought or check-in point um, or stressor can be thought of as a trigger through like this specific language. Um, so this is kind of like <laughs> the foundation of the foundation, but it's like what I've, what I've been doing a lot of work on this year is just recognizing which triggers are coming up for me when, and developing a process around self-trust and self-efficacy where anytime I feel triggered, I go do something that I feel very competent in and very confident in. Mm -hmm. So if I'm sitting down to do client work and I work with a lot of clients where like, to be completely transparent, I feel like are a lot more intelligent than me, but I'm sitting here trying to produce something for them that makes their life and their business look fantastic. And so a lot of self-doubt comes up in that process. And so anytime I'm feeling that self-doubt, I'm trying to develop a process around, okay, what can I go do that I already know I'm good at? I'm pretty good at cooking. I'm pretty good at weightlifting. I'm pretty good at um, like communicating with my friends and loved ones. So I'm in the process this year of developing the process of um, recognizing when I'm triggered in the area of doubting myself and then developing a strategy around doing things that make me feel competent enough that I'm able to sit down and focus deeply without all of that self-doubt in my mind. Um, and I learned to do that through the process of figuring out, okay, where do I need to anchor myself right now? And then what can I find in my environment that can allow me to move closer and closer to the place that I want to get to where I'm feeling a certain way. Um, but that that's a very micro way of looking at it. So you can, that's kind of like something that would happen over the course of a couple of hours, right? But you can also do this with your entire life. You can be like, okay, I want to anchor myself in a career change and then start looking for different avenues and start working through like what's going on internally. But the, the key to it all is just having so much mindfulness around what's going on in your head um, what you're becoming aware of as you go through the process, what feelings are coming up, what actions those feelings are tied to. And that's all kind of stuff that we go over in the course. Um, but yeah, I'm just at a point in my life where I'm extremely passionate about mm. mindfulness. And I think that it comes so naturally to NFPs that we almost forget to do it intentionally. <laughs> that, that, that is so interesting. And I could really uh, resonate with that, being able to draw from my own experience and coming to that kind of awareness. Before the New York City meetup group, which I helped organize, I, I'm planning to do a meetup on uh, using psychotherapeutic techniques on your own personality type. So it's, it's, it's similar in that regards. And one of the modalities would be mindfulness in itself. I love that. I love that. I think this is like a passing theory, but <laughs> that NFPs kind of learn the best through learning the models that other people would use on them. So it's like during two really bad years of my life, um, I went out and I got certified as like every type of coach you, be, you could become. Like it's like I'm currently certified as like an NLP coach, um, a health coach, a meditation coach, a mindfulness coach. And I don't coach that much. Like I do, I do a bit of coaching, um, but mostly I was just like, I need to understand all of these therapeutic models so that I can use them on myself. But if I just go to a coach, 
I spend so much time thinking about like, oh, what are you doing on me? Like, what's the what's the principle behind this? Because I want to be able to replicate it once I'm gone. Like, I don't want to come in here and be dependent on you. I want to know how to do this for myself. And I think that's such an NFP thing or an NP thing. I I, I think so. I, I'm I could really um, resonate with that. I I'm very enthusiastic about learning different models. Like, I want to. Uh, attend every single institute and every single <laughs> seminar that that's there, and I I, I do very much um, just just absorb and take in that kind of knowledge. Yeah, and that's and it's great because it's like I love that you're using it to talk about how to use this on yourself because I think another kind of blind spot that a lot of NFs in general have is like we love analyzing other people and we love learning all these models and helping other people understand themselves, but we can forget to objectively turn them on ourselves. Like we can forget that we can run our own psyches through all of these models and gain a lot of information. And it's not always easy or pretty. It doesn't always feel good. Um, but I think that especially when you have FI, which is so self-referencing, um, you can do an incredible amount of work on yourself just by learning these models. Absolutely, absolutely, I, I would, I would agree. Um, so, how about like in terms of some of the ideas you have about other personality types in terms of their personal development or like something interesting that you would like to share about them? It's hmm. a good question. I think it's interesting because it's like a question I've been asked a few times is are you going to do the boot camps for the other types? And I, my answer is always like, not alone. Like I would, you know, potentially collaborate with people of other types to do those boot camps, but I don't feel like I understand what the unique challenges are enough for the other types. But what's really cool is that people of those types can often identify the challenges very clearly. So I know that there's um, a lot of courses that are going out right now um, for other types, like personality hacker has some for NT types. Um, and I think they also have one for INFJs. I know, um, <laughs> it's funny cause I, I know people from like their Twitter handles, but um, <laughs> C note on Twitter who runs the dopamine podcast. He has um, a lot of work in the INTP space. Like he runs courses for INTP empowerment, which is really cool. Cause again, I think that NPs don't always have a lot of resources for personal development that's really catered to their perceiving style. Um, but I would say that if you're just looking to do some work on yourself and like start self-developing as any type, just be very critical of what you're reading or what you're um, engaging with and ask yourself if, it's, if it doesn't feel catered to how you would energetically operate, how can you adapt it so that it is catered to you? So like if you're reading a book that's like, okay, like the, the example I always love to use is, you know, in past years, it got really big to wake up at 5 a.m. Like that was the craze. Like everyone has to wake up at 5 a.m. and have their miracle morning and they have to journal for 10 minutes and then exercise for 10 minutes and then meditate for 10 minutes. And it's like, that can be great. Um, and it can especially be great for judging types who really like having a lot of structure in their morning. But if you're trying something like that and you're finding it isn't working for you, pay attention to that and trust that. Like it's all about trusting your intuition here because um, you're not going to grow if you're restricting your energy in the process. So I would say the most important thing to do, and this is a practice I do every single day, is like really keep a journal or keep some sort of running tally, even if it's just internally, on what parts of your day make you feel very energized and excited and like you're, you have this expansive energy um, and like your mind and body is kind of opening up to the world around you. And what parts of your day are just draining and restrictive and then start consciously constructing a schedule for yourself where you're just adding as much of that expansive energy in as you can it's going to take a lot of trial and error because some sometimes something works for a week and then your energy is is done like you've just exhausted yourself and then you need to give it some more time but over a long period of time you'll start seeing those patterns developing as well so like i tend to work in bursts of like one to two month on all the time energy and then like for the past three weeks, I've sat around and read a fiction book or two fiction books every single day for like three weeks because I just need a complete mental break. Um, so noticing your patterns and noticing what allows you to be productive, that might not be what the average person does and not feeling shame around that is going to be so important for any member of any type. So that's how you're actually going to get the stuff done and actually mm. make the changes you want to make. Yes, yeah, so this sounds like uh, incredibly... Uh, empowering, empowering, and also not stigmatizing at all. Yeah, and it shouldn't be stigmatizing, right? Because it's like, you should never feel shame 
while you're improving yourself. I'm, okay, that's not true. <laughs> you will feel shame if you're doing real work on improving yourself because you'll be confronting things that um, might feel painful at times or might feel difficult to work through. So I'm not going to say shame is absent, but you shouldn't be feeling shame about the process of self-improvement. That just means that you're probably engaging with material that isn't really right for you. Like you should feel excited about your self-improvement. You should feel excited about the new things that you're putting into place for yourself mm -hmm. um, because they should by nature be making your life better, not yes. worse. Like you shouldn't be feeling boxed in by your own self-improvement. Yeah. Uh, and I, I seen like on your channel, you have these incredible funny skits <laughs> and I could really, I, I, I could really identify with it. You have the functions within your type and also the eyes of peace type talk with one another. And then um, the funny thing about that is that I could resonate with all of your functions, but the order of the eyes of P, the T E F I order, that's the one I resonate on her side of it. So, yeah. So can, can you tell, I'm curious, like uh, in terms of NFP, like engaging in those functions, like extra thinking, introvert sensing, how does that look like for, for you? Um, do you mean like engaging with them in my real brain in my day to day life? Or do you mean like on like the videos of them? Uh, in, in, in your life and also like if perhaps you have any tips about it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's actually really cool to hear you say that, oh, you resonated with like the functions of the ENFP, but then the order of the eyes of P's F, I, and T, because that makes total sense. Cause that's right. of course, your F, I, and T, E, R. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, the reason I started doing that that way and in 2021, I'm planning to have a lot more, um, of those videos out for every type. So INFP is actually next. They'll be the, <laughs> the next one after ENFP that's going to, we're going to have a bunch of those coming out. Awesome. Um, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Yeah, no, me too. Cause it's like, it's fun. I love just having a big community of like different types interacting with each other. So I'm like, I want everyone to like be here understanding what it's like inside the minds of each other. Cause that's what I love about the community. Right. Um, but yeah, why I started doing those videos that way was just cause like, it helps me to kind of separate things inside my mind and go, okay, I may be leaning too much on FI right now and not enough on TE, or I can kind of feel like, oh, my SI is hungry for something. Like my SI has been neglected for a while. So I kind of think of the cognitive functions kind of like, um, like I feel like a lot of people in the type community when they watch the movie Inside Out, the Pixar movie, had this aha moment of, oh, that's kind of like cognitive functions. And that's how I naturally think of my own functions is like little people in my brain. Um, and so I think, and I think that thinking about them that way can really help us empathize with ourselves and our own functions as well. Cause it's like, when we start looking at, especially our inferior functions or our lesser valued functions as these, you know, like TE is just kind of this little person in my mind who maybe I've been neglecting or maybe can handle more responsibility than I'm giving them at this point. It helps us with self-compassion and it also helps us with just being very, very, very mindful and aware of what's going on inside our minds. And also recognizing when certain areas of our minds are kind of running away from us um, and not necessarily functioning within the proper boundaries. And maybe the other functions need to kind of hop to the table and like give us a little bit more structure. So for me, like there's always kind of this pull in my mind between NE wanting to go off and explore every new idea in the book and then TE and SI kind of going like, but wait, we have to get stuff done. Um, and I think that's the case for a lot of uh, NFPs in particular. Um, but yeah, looking at it through that lens can give us a greater understanding, I think, of what needs to happen in our minds and who needs to come to the table to help out, so to speak, like, mm. um, like which parts of ourselves. So I think it's, it's fun to have a visual for it, at least for me. Yes, I, I think it was a pretty powerful experience for me just to be able to basically see those uh, sub personalities and it's also validating of the fact that we we have an inner conflict and that's perfectly perfectly natural to natural to have and um just letting all the voices to to be able to speak and to to empathize with with them rather than to um I just uh, shut them out, right? Just like they're all part yeah. of a, a family, a family in your head. Exactly. No, that's exactly it. Like, I actually love how you put that because it's more concise. It's kind of giving me even language for what I'm trying to do. Um, and through the boot camps, like these characters come up all the time. Like there's 
a lot of scenes with them. And that's exactly what you start to see in both the ENFP and the INFP camps is as the course goes on, you watch these characters start to communicate better with each other and to give each other skills more and to cooperate more. And that's really what it means to to self-develop as any type is like learning to work in harmony with yourself. That's such a foundational thing for anything else that's good to come out of. Um, Because if you're constantly in conflict with yourself, which like, as you said, is going to happen, it's absolutely going to be a part of life. But if you don't know how to resolve those conflicts and you don't know how to kind of give everyone in your head the space to speak and be heard and seen and integrated, then it's just going to be a lot of um, inner conflict as you go for a really long time. Mm. That's what we want to avoid. Absolutely. Heidi, it's great to have you on my channel. This, this has been incredibly, incredibly interesting. And I'm going to have Heidi's work down below in the description so you can check it out, her YouTube channel, and also her work as well, and as well as her boot camp. So um, Heidi, it's great to have you on this channel. Oh, thanks. It's so great to be here. I always feel very excited talking to other NFPs because I'm like, ah, oh, you get it. Like I can see in your face um, and through your responses that it's like, um, the, the NFP experience is a very universal one for members of our type and like a rare one to connect on. So thanks for holding so much space for it. And um, also just like being an awesome resource to the community. because Man, you've got a wealth of content on here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.